Hi everyone, this is so exciting. Oh my goodness, I'm seeing so many people tune in and they're telling everyone where they're from in the chat. This is great. So welcome to Bella Canvas Live. We couldn't be more excited. Like everyone, we've had to adapt to massive change, but with those changes come new opportunities, including new ways of connecting with you all. With a stronger shift in the digital direction due to everyone working from home, we felt like the timing was perfect for something like this. And we are all really excited about this new life format as a way to bring you the best content and the best educational resources in the industry. We are blown away by the turnout today, so thank you all for showing up and we promise to make it worth your while. Today's topic is one relevant to just about everyone in the entire world right now, and that is what business looks like during and after the pandemic. We never thought we'd be presenting on a topic like this, and it's so crazy that we are even in this situation, but we hope arming ourselves with tools to move forward will give everyone just a little peace of mind during this incredibly stressful time. On a personal note, it has been amazing to see the way the Bella Canvas team has banded together and adapted to change. We aren't exaggerating when we say we shifted the whole business literally overnight to making masks. We started selling masks at the end of March and soon became the largest non-medical mask supplier in the world by mid-May. And I know we're not the only ones with a story like that. The entire industry has shown so much perseverance during this time, and we've seen our customers do amazing things with a super crummy situation. In the thick of it, we transitioned production of t-shirts to focus on masks but we were happy to report t-shirt sales have been an amazing recovery since that initial big dip in April. A stabilization in sales for us means good things for all of you selling apparel. Okay, let's get to why you're here. So we'll be live for about 45 minutes, including a Q&A portion at the end, but if you have to leave us, no worries, we will send you a link so you can replay this webinar later. Our first episode, we are bringing in two of our very, very best, Chris Blakesley, President of Bella Canvas, and Megan Spire, Vice President of Sales. Both will be speaking on business growth and navigating a new world of selling techniques. Then later, we will be sharing a virtual sit-down interview with our friend, Jessica Hennessy from Salesforce. And we think, we think that you're really going to gain some great tips from her. We'll wrap with a Q&A, so if you have any questions at any time, Send them over through the chat on your right on your desktop or below on your phone and we'll answer as many of these questions as we can at the end so now the introductions have been made i'd love to bring on chris blakesley so he can share a little of his insight with you guys awesome. hi chris hey claire how are you great super excited to have this so i'm going to pass it awesome. off to you all right perfect well, on behalf of everybody here at uh, Bella Canvas, I just want to thank all of you for taking your time to join us. I can't tell you how excited we are about this opportunity to connect with you. It's so cool to see all of your names coming down the right hand side of the screen. And we're hoping that you find a lot of value in this program, because if you do, then we're going to continue to do these in the future. So what I want to talk to you about today are some big picture changes that we see occurring in our market, particularly related to the demand for t-shirts and sweatshirts. And we've been researching, contemplating these issues for weeks now, and we hope to share some really interesting insights about what we think is gonna happen. So as we've all learned over the past few months, things have changed a lot. If you're like me, you probably found yourself saying the words or thinking that can't happen a lot over the past few months. Business is closing, well, that can't happen. Everybody working from home, that can't happen kids not going to school or playing sports, that can't happen. And in the end, it all happened and it had a major impact on all of us. Tomorrow, when second quarter GDP is announced, it could be as low as negative 35%, which is a level never seen before in our country's history. Now, the good news is that things in our industry seem to have begun a recovery. They seem to be improving and However, these changes that we've experienced are going to leave a lasting impression on demand. And there are a lot of factors to consider as we go through this, but I'm going to try to focus on what we believe to be the biggest impacts that we see affecting demand in our channel. And we'll call them the big three just to make it easy. So the first up is social distancing. So let's think back to six months ago, 
many of us probably wouldn't have given a second thought to packing into a crowded arena to see our favorite musician. And yet today, people step off of a sidewalk if someone else is coming toward them. Just last week, I watched people ask if they could enter an elevator that already had another person in it. And when you think about it, these are major behavioral changes. They're gonna stay with us for some time, both in terms of our personal preferences, but also continued social distancing regulations. Now, the second is the remote workplace. And if you think about what's going on over the past few months, as a country, we've probably gone through the largest social engineering experiment that we've ever seen. And it was the transition to the remote workplace. So think about this for a second. Before the pandemic, studies suggested there were about 65 million office workers in the United States. And only about 10% of those people indicated that they regularly worked from home. And yet a recent study from MIT indicated that over 50% of those office workers do not expect to return to their offices full time. So and then the third big factor that we have to talk about is the acceleration of all things digital. Now, when I say digital, I'm referring to several aspects of digital influence, including the transition from in-person interactions to digital interactions, the shift from brick and mortar purchasing to digital purchasing, and the decline of printed collateral in lieu of digital collateral. Now, before the pandemic, there were many people, including many buyers, who were less comfortable operating in a digital environment. But all of these people were forced to learn and adapt during the pandemic, and they developed new skills and a new level of comfort. So quick recap, the big three are social distancing, the remote workplace, and the acceleration of all things digital. So let's get a little bit more specific about how these changes will impact industry demand, and most importantly, how you can adapt as a seller to succeed in this new environment. So let's start by looking at a chart which summarizes the demand for basics like t-shirts and sweatshirts in our industry based upon 2019 data. So this chart summarizes the six major end use types for basic apparel in the industry. And you can see that the largest section is free merchandise, which refers to all of the industry uses in which items are given to the target customer or consumer for free. In essence, the customer isn't choosing the item. So think about game day t-shirts or the free shirt that you got when you registered for a festival. Those are really common examples. And as you can see, free merchandise drives a very significant portion of all of the basic units in our industry. Now, the second largest category is purchased merchandise or product for which the customer spends their own money. And there are many end use types that fall into this bucket, but the key distinction is that the customer is spending their own money to buy the product. And that means they care about what it is. So think about buying a t-shirt at your favorite concert, or ordering shirts for your family reunion. And then there are other categories like uniforming, which obviously refers to product that's purchased for the person to wear at work or to represent their company. Retail refers to actual retail websites like boutiques, resort stores, et cetera. Craft refers to product purchased by individuals who are embellishing or decorating at home. And team is pretty straightforward. It's basically product that's purchased for sports teams to wear. So now let's start to connect the dots here a little bit and talk about how these three big impacts are going to change industry spend. And we'll start with social distancing. So if you think about any venue that depends on attendance to generate revenue and profit, whether it be a concert venue, a sporting event, even a restaurant, to make it really simple, they typically make all of their profit on the last 10 percent or 20 percent of attendees. So automatically, with fewer people willing to attend crowded events or venues, along with required social distancing, the profitability of these businesses will be pressured for the foreseeable future, and they are going to look to cut unnecessary costs as a result. So what do you think is likely to be the first expenditure to go away? Well, if you guess free merchandise, you are probably right. You know, considering that the free merch category is the largest in the industry 
at 500 million units estimated per year, the loss demand will have a big impact. And we predict that the unit volume in this category could decline by as much as 50%, or about 250 million lost units of demand. And this means a huge decline for the trade basics category, those $2 t-shirts that we all know about that are often referred to as those throwaway giveaway items in the industry. So you might be thinking, well, then what's the good news? Well, once again, lots of businesses dependent on attendance revenue are going to need to find new or incremental sources of profit. And as a result of that, we expect the decline in free merch to be partially offset by an increase in purchased merchandise or perch merch for short. And that means about an increase of 60 million units in the premium basics category. And the good news is that those are more expensive items, so the revenue is going to be higher. Now, if you've been watching your favorite artist social media channel recently, you probably noticed more promotion of merchandise that you can buy. And that's because they don't have the live outlet to sell those products. As a matter of fact, in the new world of being more connected remotely, purchased merchandise is a great way to stay connected and still feel that sense of belonging. So for example, you could watch a live broadcast of your favorite concert at home and at the same time be wearing your fav favorite concert tee. Now, we expect the purchased merchandise category to grow by 20% in the coming year. Again, that's about 60 million units sold through our channel, offsetting a significant chunk of those lost units in free merch. And there's more good news. As I said, these items are typically higher margin, meaning more gross profit for you as a seller. Now, the shift towards the remote workplace has probably affected you personally. As a matter of fact, I'd guess it's affected all of you personally over the past couple of months, as it has us. And it's also affecting the industry. So let's take a step back for a minute, and talk about those 65 million office workers that we discussed a few minutes ago. Now, guess how many of them wore business casual clothing like button down shirts, slacks, and pantsuits to the office? So we actually just shot you a quick 10 second poll in the chat. So I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds to complete that poll. Okay, so it looks like about 40% of you have said 50%, about 35, 40% said 75%. So if you guessed about half, 50%, then you're right. Now think about a few video calls that you've been on recently. How many of those people were wearing business casual clothes? Not too many. If you think about it, they were wearing T-shirts and sweatshirts, and that's why we've seen this explosion of demand for basic casual products and athleisure. Now, we all knew that workplaces were already moving toward casual apparel, but the pandemic probably accelerated that shift by five years or more. So now let's talk about uniforming for a minute, because this is a very relevant conversation. So for sure, there will be a loss of uniforming revenue in our channel due to fewer retail employees, fewer restaurant employees, fewer hospitality employees in general. As we all know, a lot of the jobs that have been lost during the pandemic were in those categories. But at the same time, the new remote workplace will be an area of growth that may almost make up the difference. So think about this. Businesses everywhere are gonna have the challenge of connecting with team members, fostering a culture, and maintaining team spirit and doing it remotely. And casual uniforming can be a great way to support those efforts. So you really wanna to talk to all of your customers about providing their people with casual uniforms. It can be as simple as a t-shirt with the company's name or logo, and just something to remind people that they are still part of a team, even if they don't see each other as often in person. Now, while we expect the legacy demand for uniforming in the channel to decline by up to 40%. About half of that decline will be made up by this new market, this growing market for remote workplace uniforms and basics in that category. So whether you were already selling uniforming products into those legacy markets that are gonna decline, uh, or you just need to grow your business in general, this is a major opportunity for you. And you can find strong growth from being in the remote workplace uniform business. Okay. So finally, let's talk a little bit about all things digital and the acceleration that's happening. 
So one of the most interesting experiences that I encountered during the pandemic was having conversations with some of the largest direct-to-garment decorators in our industry, the DTG printers, if you will, and finding out that they were busier than ever. So during the most challenging demand in our industry's history, that segment of the industry seemed to be off the charts. And I was curious about it. And what I learned was that with so many stores closed, retail stores that sold traditional blank apparel, it helped consumers and customers discover more decorated and branded apparel online. And there had already been a trend toward customization at retail. If you walk into a Nike store these days, most offer product customization. So we know that consumers like branded and customized items that are more personalized. The other factor is that as a general public, we tend to connect more to slogans, calls to action, messages, causes during difficult times. And that also brought more demand from retail over to our channel. So collectively, we expect retail demand through our channel to increase by about 80 million units, which is actually the largest increase in any category. Now, you're going to want to make sure that you're offering your customers innovative designs and decorating techniques to take advantage of this. If you are a promotional distributor, think about how you can use an agency approach to help your customers bring those retail apparel ideas to life. If you are a decorator, be sure that you're showcasing your decoration innovation. And also, as you go forward, think about equipment investments that will allow greater flexibility for you to produce smaller quantities, but many different designs. Now, the other aspect of digital acceleration that we've all encountered over the past few months pertains to digital content. And as Megan's going to touch upon in the next session, the days of printed catalogs are over. Just like brick and mortar shoppers had to adapt to digital, so too will customers who used to prefer a printed book. Now, the challenge in our industry is that very, very few brands have strong digital content. It's come a long way in the past couple of years, but there is so much more to be done. So you have to make sure that you are partnering with brands that have digital content that are going to make you look like you were on the cutting edge. And as we'll share in Megan's session, be sure that you're honing your skills and your tools that you use to become an incredibly effective virtual seller. Now, finally, I'm going to leave you with an idea. And that idea is that one person's obstacle becomes another person's opportunity. Throughout history and business, some of the greatest successes have come from the greatest challenges. And by anticipating them, recognizing where opportunities will decline, where new ones will arise, you can adjust your focus on strategy to succeed. So I hope this gave you a lot to think about. In the next session, Megan's going to go further to give you some practical ideas on how to become a more powerful virtual seller. Again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Megan. Thanks, Chris. Hey, guys. I'm Megan Spire, Vice President of Sales. Thank you so much for joining us today. Like many of you, our team has been forced to pivot and change our approach to selling during the past few months. Our industry has historically been driven by in-person engagement, presentations and pitches to clients, trade shows, open houses, and events. And it's also largely been driven by the infamous industry selling tool, the catalog, which now appears to be going extinct. This big book is rapidly being replaced with new digital ways of selling. Trade show attendance and catalog use were already on their way out, but COVID-19 has really accelerated this decline. Plus, in-person meetings aren't necessarily an option at the moment, depending on where you're located. So how do you continue to sell and remain relevant in this new landscape? I'm going to speak to three ways you can really stand out as a virtual seller. One, perfect the virtual meeting. Two, capitalize on the unboxing experience. And three, create community and drive relationships through virtual events. The first thing is to nail your virtual meeting game. I'm sure at this point we've all wished we invested in Zoom or made jokes about the moments that were not supposed to be caught on camera. Our industry, like many others around the world, has shifted to virtual selling, and it's widely unknown when field travel will be back to normal. So for this reason, digital engagement has never been more important. So how do you effectively sell through a video meeting? 
first, and most of you already know this, but actually use the video feature. Video calls are much more personal than a phone call. Show your customers your face through video conferencing and encourage them to turn their cameras on as well. This will allow you both to read each other's verbal and facial cues. You get to see how they react and they can see how excited you are about your product and your content, which will ultimately get them more interested in what you're selling. To make sure the video meeting is a success, it never hurts to send instructions ahead of time for those who may not be as comfortable with this format and make sure your background setting is as professional as possible. If you're presenting product, there are a few ways to do it. Of course, you can physically hold up product to the screen. The downside to this is that it can be hard to see the product details, but we like this approach because it has the familiarity of an in-person meeting. If you do choose to go this route, make sure the lighting is strong and your camera is set up a little bit at a distance. Overhead lighting can be a challenge for this format, so if you're planning to show product this way, you might want to consider investing in an inexpensive tripod light. I bought mine on Amazon and it has transformed the live presentation experience for me. Also, be wary of audio if you're going to be stepping away from the computer. AirPods are a great solution for this. You want to make sure your customers can hear you well. And ultimately, we don't see the need for virtual meetings going away anytime soon, so it doesn't hurt to invest in a few supplies that will make you a much more confident seller. We also recommend incorporating multimedia whenever possible. It ensures a dynamic and interesting experience for your attendees. Just because the meeting is virtual doesn't mean that it also shouldn't be visual. We love utilizing screen share and showcasing trends through a curated deck. If you don't have the graphic design resources for something like that, another option is to utilize uh, resources available to you online. You can show customers video content. We have a ton to choose from on our YouTube channel. And you can also send links to articles and resources through the chat feature. For example, I'll be sending you guys right now the outline of today's live session in case you want to reference it later. In addition, navigating products online is actually more dynamic than flipping through a, a catalog. Bookmark a few web pages prior to the meeting so there's no lag time. If you're talking about the fleece trend, for example, preload styles you want to show. This will allow you to toggle through them back and forth and zoom in on various features that you might want the customer to, to get to see. We also just launched our shop by color feature uh, on our website, which will allow you to shop uh, specific products by color type. We know that almost all buying decisions in our industry are fueled by color. So this is a digital way of bringing a color card to life. Let's say you're working with a school that needs tees, hoodies, and youth options in, a color, in the color forest. During a virtual meeting, you can use the Shop by Color tool to quickly navigate to a page showing all options in Forest. Now, the second way to stand out as a virtual seller is to capitalize on the excitement of unboxing experiences. Just because you're no longer meeting in person does not mean that tactile sampling, which our industry is so accustomed to, must end. People love unboxing things. There's a reason why unboxing videos have hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. We all love receiving something shiny and new. For the first 200 of you who pre-registered, we wanted to give you a little taste of that unboxing experience. You received a printed hoodie in our beautiful sample packaging with a handwritten note. I bet it made you feel special, huh? The details really matter here. It's an opportunity to create a feeling. Katie Collar from ASB already adopted this approach and posted a video of her unboxing our gift as best practices uh, for her clients. Thanks, Katie. And this presentation should be impeccable. A branded box, handwritten note card, sharp marketing materials, and of course, high quality curated product. Given what goes into something like this, it won't be possible for every virtual meeting, but it should be considered for those high value opportunities where you're really aiming to impress. The presentation of the sample materials can often make or break a deal. For example, we put a lot of effort into our face mask sample kits, which was a new endeavor for us at the start of COVID. Each sample kit included the retail packs, along with a letter from Chris, a product page, and it was packaged like a gift. We heard from several large customers that the presentation went a long way towards winning the goal. And in the past, promo samples were shipped rather informally, but now companies and brands are shipping to people's homes. Take advantage of this opportunity to really create excitement and a feeling around your services. Just because the conversation is virtual doesn't mean the whole experience has to be. Now, lastly, the third way you can differentiate yourself as a virtual seller is by hosting creative virtual get togethers. Our industry is largely built on relationships. We're used to attending events, grabbing dinner and drinks, hosting lunch and learns and engaging in team bonding experiences. So it's important that even during this time, you continue to feel relationships with your clients. 
So how do you accomplish this when everyone is supposed to stay at home? We spoke with Salesforce, the country's leading CRM platform, and really an expert in bringing customers and companies together. In this new age of virtual meetings, they have reallocated their travel budget to unique customer engagement tactics. We spoke with Jessica Hennessy, an account executive at Salesforce, who shared ways they have been able to differentiate through this method. Let's check out the interview. So my name is Jessica Hennessy, and I work at Salesforce as an account executive. So technically that means I am in sales, and I specifically sell to work with help um, retailers and consumer goods within the West Coast. Could you share with us a little bit about how your selling strategy has changed um, since COVID started? Definitely. It was an interesting pill for me to swallow. I've always worked in the office. I love the office. I'm very routine. I love my team and being on the phone. And I also traveled a lot. What have you found to be successful ways, you know, given that you, you're a face-to-face -face person and you engage so much with your customers on a regular basis, now that that's all changed and you can't travel, how do you maintain those relationships? Yeah, and relationships are not only important to like Salesforce as a whole and how we manage our business, but they're really important to me because I would consider myself a people person. But the first thing I tried to really do was make sure that our video is showing. I want my face to show and anyone else I bring on that call, I want their face to show. And, you know, there are struggles when adapting to new technologies and changes like this. They can be scary. So I know that a lot of the times my customers, you know, get flustered trying to start up a video chat, which I totally understand. So I would send instructions every morning, be like, hey, good morning. Just a reminder for our call today, we are using Google Hangouts. Here's the link, use Chrome. Um, so I templated a little tiny blurb and I put it in my notes on my computer. I put a reminder for myself to tell my customers every day. Um, and even if that annoys them, like it's just a way for us to be efficient and personal. Yeah, for success. I want to at least try to put my eyes to their, you know, video call and have them see me. And um, so that was something I've asked my whole team to do every single time we get on a call. And then the second thing that I've really tried to hone in on instead of traveling is setting up virtual happy hours or any type of virtual experience doesn't always have to be work related but at least a way for me to represent myself as your account executive to your account and getting to know each other. So yeah, setting up a lot of different virtual kind of ideas that I've been thinking about. And how do you balance content in a, in a virtual sales call uh, versus <laughs> like you said, happy hour? What does that look like for you? Yeah, that is, <laughs> that's a really good question. So it definitely, it depends on the customer. If I am doing a virtual happy hour, I would prefer to not necessarily have a lot of Salesforce content thrown at them because in my eyes, if I'm going to have a happy hour, it's going to be after work. I'm moving from my, you know, kitchen office to my living room office to enjoy <laughs> this happy hour. Like you don't want to keep feeling like you're working. Um, but I've tried to have some other ideas like a lunch and a learn. So if I'm going to send you, you know, like a gift card and you can order locally to your house, support local business, and then we'll get together during lunch time and learn, then that customer knows I'm going to be presenting to you things about Salesforce, whether not the only thing, but a very important thing that doesn't have to be six feet away from us right now is technology. So use it to your benefit. And that is what I tell my team all the time. Cause they're like, how do you come up with these things? Like you've never talked to them before. Like, what do you know how to do? I'm research, I'm getting creepy and I'm using technology. I'm going to look at LinkedIn. I'm going to look at your website. I'm going to buy something from there. I'm going to try to be your customer and have your experience. So I have some type of point of view on my outreach, my event, um, my talk track and just using technology to extend that olive branch because I can't just fly down and 
and smile and get to know you guys. Right, so that's, that's really good advice. <laughs> and I know you mentioned virtual get togethers. Uh, mm -hmm. What activities have you done? You mentioned a happy hour. What else have you done? Yeah. Uh, that's been uh, a hit with your customers. Totally. So last quarter I did a, a virtual wine tasting happy hour. It was so much fun. This was the first time ever. I actually did it with your company, I Bella Canvas. <laughs> you, you are, you were not there. You are busy. <laughs> it's totally fine. But I met so many people on your end. This was when I was just giving, uh, got the account. Like I mentioned earlier, I got a new one, a lot of new ones this year. And I took other pieces of technology and I incorporated that into the virtual tasting and I played a Kahoot. So if you're not familiar with that, it is an online game. I'll just say that Google it after, you know, it even took a little bit for me to figure it out, but it was so much fun. I looked at everyone's LinkedIn profiles. I created questions for all of us to play. Um, about your team specifically based upon my creepy LinkedIn with Kahoot in a virtual zoom drinking wine. So that was last quarter and it was incredibly successful. And then the second one that I've planned for this quarter, it has not happened yet, but I know that it's going to be absolutely amazing is Margs and queso. So I'm having a kit delivered to every single attendee's house sure with to attend this. One. Yes. <laughs> I will send you a reminder on how to log into the Zoom again. <laughs> and then we'll kick it off with an hour long. A chef and a mixologist is coming onto the call and they will be walking all of us virtually through making queso and a marg with the kit that they sent. So sounds super exciting. I can't wait. I love um, creativity and to yeah. your point, um, mirroring or matching uh, technology in a new mm -hmm. way to connect with customers virtually. And even though it might be a, a, a video experience, yeah. the actual activity is not virtual. And that's what I love. It's something tactile. It's something tangible. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little drinking involved. Uh, yeah. It makes it a lot of fun. And then do you guys, is your perspective on it that you're using funds that you would normally budget for travel to do these types of experiences? Because I, I imagine that they're not cheap. Yes, 100%. So like funds have changed here and there, but obviously what we did spend on travel, this is, this is now like the opportunity that I get to bring to the table. And traveling, you don't think about it, you do it, you set up the time in the meeting and you go and you bring lunch or whatever it may be, you set up a dinner. But now we have to be creative. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's absolutely incredible. It's a new challenge and a skill that we all have to go through. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much into not reinventing the wheel. So take my ideas like from these discussions and we'll all, we're all here to help each other through this, you know, change in life. But we do have to be creative and, and use technology to do it. Well, thank you so much, um, Jessica, for your time and your expertise. Uh, we so appreciate it. And we'll absolutely be applying this uh, in the field and sharing the knowledge with uh, the industry. Definitely. Anytime. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Um, that was really great. I love everything Jessica had to say. She really got creative in a time full of obstacles. So we really love her and appreciate her insight and hope that all of you found that interview useful. Um, so now we would love to kick off a Q&A with Megan and Chris. We'll bring them back on. Um, and we have a few questions that came in early. So I think we're going to start with those. But if there are any other questions, hi, Megan. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, if there are any other questions you guys have, please feel free to ask them in the chat section. You can do it privately or um, in the group chat, and we're going to get started and answer some of those for you guys. So one of the first questions we have is, what do you think the future of masks is for 2021? Uh, cool. Well, maybe I'll, I'll take a run at this one, and then Megan can add to it. Um, I think that, you know, if, if uh, those on, on the conference with us have been following a lot of our content, uh, you know, we believe that we became one of the biggest producers of fa fabric face masks in the world, if not the biggest. And so we actually take the business very, very seriously. It wasn't just something that we did 
uh, on the side. And so we, we feel an obligation to sort of, you know, stay uh, up on current events and predict what's going to happen. Our view is that this business is going to be with us for a while. I mean, we're all hearing about vaccine and we're all hopeful, I think, as, as members of the general public. But at the same time, the likelihood that that gets us through this, even by the end of next year, to the point we wouldn't need masks is, is fairly low based on what we read and what we know. And so we think it, it endures at least through the end of 2021. Uh, and we are preparing our business, continue to prepare our business to be able to support that side of it and, you know, our traditional uh, great T-shirts and, and sweatshirts. And as you consider that in so many parts of the country, masks are required now, you have to grab one on your way out the door. And as a new really demand stream in our industry, there's a ton of opportunity uh, from a uniforming perspective. Uh, essential businesses in the food service space, grocery, safety, construction, hospitality, all of these essential workers require uniforms, uniforms on their backs, and really they should be considering uniforms for face masks as well, something that's mm -hmm. cohesive and approachable, in many cases branded as well. And that's really the bread and butter of our industry is, is uniforming and outfitting. So as you consider ways to uh, tap into this demand, um, outfitting uniforms with only not only shirts, but masks as well is where uh, you all can have a lot of success. That's great. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. So I'm just gonna Bring kind of kick off a few more here. Um, okay, so did switching over to all mask production earlier this year affect the supply chain of apparel? Will we see some, gap some gaps soon? Uh, well, you know, let, me, let me maybe make a run at that one too. So, um, you know, I think probably like most of your businesses, you know, we as a company back in March had to do the best that we could to predict what was going to happen, you know, through this whole uh, situation. And so, uh, you know, we definitely during that period of time pulled back on production, never really stopped completely, but pulled back on our traditional products. And that gave us the ability to ramp up mask production during uh, that period. And now that we see demand coming back, which over the past, you know, six to eight weeks in particular, we've seen just a, a fantastic recovery of our traditional demand, uh, we've added production capacity to be able to keep up with both. So there is a process for sure. When you pull back on production in the types of products that we make, there's a process of rebuilding and getting everything back to 100% again, and we're in the midst of that. So we're probably going to have, you know, a couple little bumps in the road, but we're confident about our ability to maintain uh, the ability to keep up with demand and service the, the channel. And rest assured, we are uh, after it as fast as we can be. That's great. Um, okay, so another question is, you've been so good about following trends. Does this new world make that challenging? Megan, you wanna go on that one? I don't think that it changes our ability to do trend forecasting. Um, you know, we've, we've got a team that does research and development and we're able to take a look at not only what we're seeing at retail, but even with this shift from brick and mortar into online, there's a, a, an explosion with influencers who are still posting content. You know, there's more of an emphasis on digital, but fashion is still alive and well. And so, you know, whether it's color trends or silhouettes or textures, we're still planning, you know, seasons ahead. And you'll see more of that to come from Bella Canvas as the landscape starts to shift. Yeah, and Claire, I, I'd add, I think the, the key thing is to try to predict how these uh, changes that we talked about during the session today will affect different parts of demand. Because we, you know, what we want to be able to do is to support all of our customers, not only with information, but with the right products to hit the areas that are going to do well while we're waiting for all those other areas that used to sustain all of us to catch up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we're investing a lot of time and effort and money into you know, doing that research and understanding that so that we can bring it to the marketplace. Yeah, I agree. We're definitely always on top of trends. So I don't feel like we would ever decline in that category. Um, okay, so another question is, um, someone said, I love Jessica's ideas. Any thoughts for small businesses that don't have a strong travel budget? I think that you can find different unique ways of creating that um, that connection. So um, I think you have to be strategic and targeted about who you 
you know, do those exercises with. Um, and you can do it on a, you know, a, on a sliding scale. So maybe it's um, just a handwritten note card. Maybe it's a handwritten note card and, um, you know, a five dollar uh Postmates gift card for some for them to deliver, you know, coffee to them, something along those lines. You don't have to go grandiose, um, depending on uh, who you're targeting, how many people you're going to have in the meeting. You can adjust um, and, and just try to be a little bit more uh, targeted with those efforts. Yeah, I think, you know, it, oh, I'm sorry, Claire, I was just going to add that I think that um, there are a lot of, of, you know, the big wholesale distributors in the industry, you know, certainly us. I mean, we're all anxious to help our customers get back into growth mode. And so if there are some things that we can help with samples and, you know, boxing experiences and ideas and those kinds of things, you know, we're, we're always up to have that conversation because ultimately we just want you to succeed. If you succeed, we succeed. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually uh, had a personal experience kind of along the lines of what Jessica was talking about was I constantly in marketing, I constantly get people emailing me, wanting to pitch their marketing platform for this reason and that reason. And I had one guy reach out to me and he did his research like Jessica did. And he figured out where I went to school, figured out that I liked football and he made a bet with me. And he said, okay, there's a game next weekend. Like, you know, not in COVID time. So this was last year. He said, there's a game next weekend. Let's make a bet. If your team wins, then I will send you a, I went to Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. He said, I'll send you an OU uh, sweatshirt. And I said, okay. And he said, if he loses, then like no commitment by me. <laughs> I don't have to take his call or anything. Um, my team won. So I ended up getting the sweatshirt and I got onto him because it wasn't Valley Canvas. But um, <laughs> it was a really lasting impression that I had. And so then we connected on LinkedIn and we kind of share what... Um, each other's doing in the businesses. So I think when you really go that extra mile, it really does pay off like Jessica yeah, was talking about. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question. Uh, what are the best products to sell for Perch Merch category? I think uh, one of the categories that we have had the most success with is our street fleece. Looking at the fleece category as a whole, uh, in 2019, we were up almost 100%, and even year to date now during COVID, it continues to be one of our fastest growing categories. And when you consider that you're looking at, you know, 11 to 16 dollar items compared to three, four dollar items, not only is it the fastest growing category, but it is also one of the most profitable. So as we consider what types of products should we be showing for purchased merchandise, you absolutely cannot go wrong with fleece. Um, it's cozy, it's comfortable. You you see several different trends in play, you know, in the retail space, uh, as Chris mentioned, there's a, a new openness to a casual, comfortable way of dressing. And for that reason, athleisure has absolutely taken off and exploded and, and fleece is well suited uh, joggers and, and comfy hoodies uh, to address uh, that category. But also, as we look to high fashion, you see fleece on runways. Um, we see luxury labels doing collaborations with really cool and edgy um, streetwear brands. And so what we've aimed to do is inject color and silhouettes and texture to the Bella Canvas assortment to address uh, really the streetwear trend. And so for this reason, you know, for Perch Merch, I, I think that uh, you, you can't go wrong with, uh, with our street fleece. Yeah, and Claire, I'll, I'll add to, to Megan's comments that, you know, when it comes to purchase merchandise, it's so important that decoration match the product. It's got to come together really well. And uh, and I'm guessing some uh, who are participating with us have been in the Bella Canvas Fashion Apparel Masterclass and have been through the decorating lesson. If you haven't, it's a great place to go learn about how to match great decorating techniques with amazing product. But the other thing is that, you know, we're so fortunate in that our industry has so many incredible decorators. And this is a great opportunity for promotional distributors and salespeople on the promotional side to come together with their decorator partners proactively and work on these projects together because there just isn't another industry as creative. And bringing those two together creates great purchased merchandise. I love that. Um, okay, so we've hit our 45 minute time here. So um, I would love to end with a closing poll. Let's see. 
for you guys. Okay. So what do you want to hear about next? Selling fleece, a category with the highest margin potential, or selling masks, an of-the-moment category with huge demand? So I'll leave that poll up for you guys. Go ahead and submit what you would like to learn about. Oh my gosh, you guys are voting so fast. <laughs> Definitely looks like majority is leaning towards fleece. That is really great um, to get your feedback on that. So thank you guys. Um, we'll definitely take that into consideration as we are excited to start working on our next session. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This was the first of many monthly events to come. We love getting to connect with you all, listening to your feedback and sharing our experiences through this crazy time has been a great way to support one another and continue to move forward. So thank you all again for tuning in and we are so excited to catch you on the next Bella Canvas Live. Thanks everyone. Bye guys. Thank you.